Good morning, Alter Realty Group agents. This is Kevin Lauren. I'm the Director of Training and Marketing here. And today we are lucky to be joined by Michelle Denays and Trix Tr Trish Troxler from Tycor Title. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Good morning. Good. Thank you. Happy to be here. Excellent. And so today is a really, really important webinar. Um, as agents, you know, it is our responsibility to be able to tr uh, teach our clients about the latest forms of wire fraud, what to look out for, you know, we're the professionals. So it really, the onus does come back on us. Um, so ladies, we're really excited about today's webinar. Thank you. And Trish, if you'd like to, to start and kind of give us a little bit of your background and uh, that would be fantastic. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Trish Troxler. I am uh, working with about five different states of our FNF uh, family of uh, teams here in California, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, just really trying to get the message out about wire fraud and some of the better practices that we can all implement because this is a huge epidemic. Uh, we know that, you know, basically, you know, our average bank robber can get about $130,000 or uh, actually $3,900, but he actually, when it comes to wire fraud, they are getting about $129,000. So sucks. this is something that we really need to think about of, you know, as we move forward, what are some of the things that we can change about us, how we conduct ourselves on the internet, so that when we are talking with our clients and trying to educate them, we are actually having a conversation with them because we've already made those changes and they, when they're listening to us, it's more authentic based on the fact that, you know, we've already made some of those changes. So through today's presentation, guys, I mean, I am cutting this short. This is usually a good hour, hour and a half um, presentation, but I really want to plant the seed with you guys. I want you to start thinking about, um, you know, day in and day out of your business. And it's unfortunately, we all kind of have to be a little bit more on the defensive and uh, you know, kind of a, a scare factor when we are conducting business. And the reason why is anytime that you guys do a transaction, the only time you are paid is when the transaction closes. And what we're seeing is a lot of attempts and actual diversions near the end of a transaction. You just spent 30, 45 days on the transaction, and then all of a sudden there's no money to close the transaction, and you just did not get paid. Yeah. So as we go through this, guys, in fact, I would love everybody that's on this call, if you have a pen and paper, write the word best practice on it. And throughout this, I'm going to throw out some of these ideas of best practices that you can implement in your business because what we want to do is try out a couple of them. I mean, I'm probably going to give you about 10 of them, but I want to make sure that when you guys are implementing some of these best practices, that you try a couple and then get comfortable with it, change your mindset and move forward, and then maybe add another one to that. Because, you know, if you're like me, basically if I try and overdo something, I fail. And it's better to see some changes in how we're conducting ourselves. So with that said, I'm just gonna come. Oops, sorry go. about that. We, I, I, no I muted you for a half a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good. Okay, so here's the thing, guys. You know, basically, you're going to hear business email compromise or BEC. When you are talking with your buyers and sellers, break it down to layman's terms because a lot of times in our business, we tend to over um, educate in language that our clients are not familiar with, right? We've for got sure. acronyms for oh, everything, yeah. right? Yeah. So one of the things is I want you guys to think about all business email etic or etiquette, business email compromise really is, is it's all about phishing. It's about spoofing, right? Mm -hmm. And phishing, guys, I mean, we've all been fished. Anyone that has ever received an email, let's say from, you know, Amazon Prime or uh, Wells Fargo or PayPal that, hey, you need to update your username and password and you go and you just click on that link instead of going to the actual web portal to do that update and password, a lot of times what these, these guys will do is they'll throw a page up there that looks almost exactly like a Wells Fargo page, 
and you are now giving a fraudster access to your bank account by adding your username and password, okay? Oh, yeah. You need, you need to think about any time, even before you're even, even in a transaction, these fraudsters are phishing and spoofing you. Why? Because you have a target on your back. Every person that's a part of a transaction has a target on their back. And these fraudsters know our timelines. They know your workflows. They know when to sit there and stay inside of somebody's email and sit there and just wait patient. I call them little patient trolls because they're just waiting for the right time to kick in and insert themselves to try and divert money from our buyers and our sellers. Okay. And the way that they're doing this as part of it is that phishing. So whenever you receive a link in an email, you know, what you can do if you're on your desktop, you can take your mouse and you can hover over it to see exactly where that link is going. But most of us, our cell phones are our computers. If you are receiving an email from somebody that A, you're not expecting it, right? Or B, that you, you know, get this email from somebody that says, hey, I want you to represent me. Here is my lender approval letter. I want to go look at this you know, $800,000 home. Well, yeah, that sounds great and that's wonderful because that's what you guys are in the business of doing is branding and marketing yourself to get people to reach out to you that you've never met before. But instead of just clicking on that link, one of your better practices would be, and I'd add that to your list, is to find a phone number within that email and call them directly to make sure who they are and that truly is a real link. Because if there is an attachment or a link in there that they want you to click on, that could be downloading malware to your system, giving that fraudster complete access to your email as oh, well as sure. your computer. Okay. And Trish, I think, and you'll probably go over this, but, you know, um, also a good idea is, you know, if there is, you know, information that you're interested in, just do a Google search and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get to that website on your own, not through a link that a possible fraudster has sent you, right? Exactly. And that's one of the things is, you know, never, you know, I know in the holidays, because I hate shopping, so all of my shopping I do online. Well, during the holidays, I was getting all these emails from Nordstrom, from, you know, Target, from Walmart, from Macy's saying, here's your order tracking number, right? But I hadn't even done shopping at those. And so right. what they were trying to do was fish me for me to get, you know, click on something that I'm familiar with and then go and I just downloaded malware. So anytime that you're getting an email from something like that, a business, you're never going to get an email from a Wells Fargo or a Chase or any bank that you bank with that says you need to update your username. You want to go directly to that website yeah. and then yeah. go in and see if, you know, they actually sent that. And the other thing is, you know, you, you also have to think about we work with a ton of realtors. We work with them over and over. So they become familiar with you, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a better practice would be when, when, suddenly you get an email from them and all of a sudden there's a link in there or an attachment, you know, picking up the phone and calling them as well, because they know our relationships online. They know who we work with because it is splattered all over social media of who is our preferred lender, who's our preferred escrow, who's, you know, who we like working with on certain transactions. And so they know those people. So they're going to send you emails on behalf of those people. In fact, I have to laugh about it because recently I got an email from my husband <laughs> and it was like, Hey, check this out. I just saw this and I thought of you. Well, had I not realized when I looked at that email address, I'm like, wait, that is not my husband's email address. I had to stop and look because that wasn't something the norm. So even though it is someone familiar guys still pay attention because on this next slide here, this is talking about, you know, spoofing. And really what spoofing is, guys, it's where we are receiving emails from somebody and the email address is off just a little bit. So for exactly. example, oh yeah, we've my, all seen this yeah. one. <laughs> and and my email, you know, it could be Trish or it it is actually Trish.troxler at FNF.com. But if somebody was trying to portray that they were me, it could be Trish.troxler 
fnf at gmail.com. My I could be a one, my O could be a zero, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like going and buying like a knockoff Gucci bag on the streets of New York. Everything looks almost perfect, but the stitching is off just a little bit. Now, one of the things I do want to address on this is I used to say, hey, when you get an email, pay attention to the header, which is this top section up here where it says real buyer and real lender. But what these fraudsters are doing now is they are taking over the whole from line. So before it would say on the from line, it would show like that little portrait of the gmail.com. Well, now if you are receiving an email, it would say trish.troxler um, at fnf.com, and that's all you would see in the from line. They've gotten smarter. Okay? Uh, they're, they're getting smarter every day, Trish. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. When you see these statistics, you're going to see how smart they're getting on taking away the money, too. But I want you guys, whenever you get an email, right, instead of just hitting reply and typing in an email, maybe hit reply, but at that point, take a look at the header. Because if you hit reply and all of a sudden it's not that email address, you want to make sure that you might, you know, take a look at it. Because if that's not the normal email address that that's the person you're working with, you might be part of a spoofed email. Okay. Now, the other part on that, add a better practice. When you guys are sitting with your clients at the very beginning, right, you're sitting down with, you know, the possible seller or the possible buyer and you're having them sign contracts and things like that. Set the stage early on with them. Set the stage where you're setting up the expectations of what to look out for them during the transaction. Because guess what? They are the ones that are getting the spoofed emails. They are the ones that are getting fished in these transactions. So if you tell your client at the very beginning saying, hey, by the way, you know, wire fraud is a huge epidemic. Here are a few tips I want you to watch out for and just kind of red flag it. And if you see any of these, follow your gut and think, and I want you to call me immediately. You can say, the only email address you will receive from me is, and you give them your email address, give them your business card, and say, if you ever receive an email other than this, I need you to pick up the phone and call me. And then also give them the better practices of, hey, pay attention to the reply line, because these guys are doing spoofing, and we do not want to have any chance where you could possibly lose money, right? The other part is these fraudsters hit while we're sleeping, okay? So unless you are a crazy non-sleepy, you know, person that is working until 3 o'clock in the morning, set the stage and tell your client, you know, when we're working together, I will never email you between midnight and 5 o'clock in the morning. If you ever receive an email during that time frame, pick up the phone and call me because I'm not going to do that. Now, if you ever have to do something like that, pick up the phone and call them and let them know, hey, by the way, I know that we had discussed that I would not do this during these time frames, but I sent you an email and that is from me. Please call me back to confirm or whatever. But setting those expectations early on is going to help you in the long run. Wow, so, Trish, that's really, really cool. And one, one thing I'd like to point out is we've been talking a lot on our recent trainings about reengaging your sphere of influence. And, uh, and one of the things that we've been talking about is providing them with a, wel a client welcome kit. And so this could be an amazing part of that client welcome kit where you're giving those people your best practices for, uh, for dealing with online fraud. You know what, exactly. Especially now, guys, it's part of your contract. You yeah. know, and, yeah. you know, I, and I'm going to tell you guys a quick story in regards to the, you know, spoofing and stuff like that. You know, because I do work in a lot of states and I'm always watching the news because I'm bored in a hotel room or whatever. But every time I'm in a location, I'm hearing on the news about another agent's email has been hacked and the title company and escrow company has been hacked and the buyers lost thousands and thousands of dollars. Right. So first off, guys. I want you guys to have a good understanding of hacked versus spoofing. We're seeing a lot more spoofing than we are actually seeing of hacked emails. Hacked means that the fraudster is actually inside your email controlling your email, right? And spoofing is where they are trying to be a part of the conversation, but they're trying to push it offline to another email address, okay? So be very, you know, 
having those conversations with them. And, you know, in the situation, I'm just going to use this one in Colorado, you know, a little old couple, they were selling their home. They wanted to move closer to their children. So they had about $285,000 proceeds from the sale of their home, and they were going to pay cash for their new home. Seven days before closing, they received a spoofed email from the escrow closer saying, in order for you to close on time, you need to go to the bank today and wire your 265000 whatever it was, to close the transaction. So they not only said they had to do it, right, they had to do a wire, but they had to do it immediately, sense of urgency. That is one of the things that is also a red flag, and we'll go into some of the indicators here shortly. But knowing that that, you know, sense of urgency, go and do it. So this little old couple went to the bank. They did their wire. Seven days later, they're sitting down at the closing table. Colorado is a table funding where buyers and sellers sit together, and they get the keys and all of that and sign all the documents. Well, the escrow officer says to him, hey, by the way, everything's good to go. We just need your closing proceeds. And the seller's like, hey, I sent that to you guys seven days ago. Okay. Needless to say, the transaction didn't close because they sent it to a fraudulent bank account. And they are now suing, because it was a complete buyer diversion, they are suing the realtor broker, they're suing the realtor directly, and the escrow company and the bank. And what they are suing on is, you guys are in the industry, you should have known better, and you should have educated us. Wow. Okay? And, uh, and this has been going on almost a year and a half now. The bank has since about three months ago tried to settle with them and they declined. They want to sit in front of a judge and 12 jurors and say, you know what? Nobody educated us. Nobody even mentioned wire fraud. So kudos to California guys, because California is the first state that implemented a wire document within your contract. If you have not taken the time to read that document, it's for your buyers and sellers. Part of your due diligence is to educate them, okay? Now, if I was a realtor, I wouldn't just rely on that one document. I would set up some of these better practices, have them sign that off in your welcome kit, right? That mm -hmm. these were the things that you also discussed. You know how much easier it would be for you to get pulled out of a court case if you not only did what California rule was, but also had your own extra layer of protection and education to them? Yep. You may not be going through and being in front of that jury. You may be pulled out during investigation. So that's where I think you guys, if we really put up some of these changes, we're going to start educating these guys even more so because they don't understand. They are pretty much clueless because at the end of the day, guys, when we are doing a transaction to all of us on this call, it's a business to our buyers and sellers. It's personal. And every one of you, if you've ever made personal decisions, you follow your heart, not your head all the time. And so things are being thrown at you and you just sign and you do what's being told of you. They need to have a few seeds planted in their head to slow them down and go, oh, wait a second. My agent educated and said, they're never going to email me at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, wait a second. They emailed me at three o'clock in the morning. I need to call them. That's what we want to do. Okay. So just be really understanding of like knowing the difference of phishing, knowing the difference of spoofing, right? And how these guys are working. So I want yeah. to go into, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Trish, you know, um, don't cut your, your uh, presentation short. If we, you know, I, I'd actually like to have you come back next week, perhaps. Um, <laughs> I will be, I will be actually uh, on vacation next week, but if you could come back next week and, and you know, because this is such an important uh, topic and it's not something that we just want to gloss over. So um, just continue at your own pace and we will okay. definitely, you know, if it's not next week, then the following week, you know, this is just stuff that we, we, we've got to have our agents uh, versed in all of this. Perfect. And Kevin, we'll get together on some dates because I'm actually Colorado next week and the following week I'm in Vegas and then Colorado. So got we it. will get this on our calendar definitely because you know guys here's the thing to me i don't care what realtor company you work at i don't care what title or escrow company that you're working with 
my goal is to make sure that we are all speaking a consistent, cohesive message across the board so that at the end of the day, the buyers and sellers, they're hearing the same message. They're not listening to the news on that it was a realtor's fault when they're not IT, they have not contacted the realtor to actually go in and see if their email was actually compromised, right? right. They haven't contacted us. So this is to me, I want to have more of a positive feed of education. In fact, I have to laugh and I, I kind of told um, Kevin this, you know, yesterday is, you know, when I'm out there and I have been traveling quite a bit, there isn't a bartender or an Uber driver that does not know about wire fraud because <laughs> I'm constantly <laughs> preaching it, right? Yeah. Well, when I was in Colorado, I was in um, an Uber driver and he said, and he all of a sudden tar started telling me everything that I'd been teaching out there. Talk about proud mommy moments. This agent had educated him during his transaction and not only just did the touch points at the beginning of the transaction, but reached out to him about every four to five days to reiterate some of those touch points and better practices through the whole transaction. Wow. And I'll tell you right now, guys, think about it. What are we in the business for? We're in the business to get referrals. How do we get referrals? We build trust with the existing sphere of influence that we work with. And if we can get, get that trust, they're going to refer business to us. They're going to give us testimonials. What better way to get a testimonial and a referral from somebody because you you now have educated and you created a value about you because you really care about them and you really help them through this transaction. Trish, now I'm having so, a little uh, proud mommy moment because you're saying all the <laughs> things that I preach about. <laughs> And we didn't stage this, guys, at all. <laughs> no, not at all. No, excellent. And then, right, uh, so guys, the other thing that Trish and I talked about is having uh, Trish come back once a quarter at a minimum and keeping us updated on what's going on. Because as we know, this is a moving target. They're getting smarter all the time. And so that's something that's in the works as well. Exactly. Hey, um, Kevin, I have a little thing that says, please move window away from shared application. Is that... Are you seeing the presentation? No. Nope. Is there any issues with it? Okay, nope, good. Not at all. Just all right. It's just, okay, perfect. Okay. So, guys, here's – I just want to throw some statistics at you, right? So, in 2016, we know that um, these fraud schemes have been thrown out to the Internet in 50 states and 131 countries. There's been over 40,000 victims of um, cyber fraud attacks, okay, over $5 billion in losses. The FBI states that by 2021, it's going to be over $21 billion in losses, okay? Now, this is not just relevant to uh, real estate transactions. This is everything. So if any of you guys have accidentally clicked on a link, gave somebody access to your bank account, and you lost that $2,500, you're part of that cyber fraud attack, okay? But how this is affecting us today is in 2016, we had a 480% increase. We know that we lost $19 million in real estate transactions. Wow. Now, in 2017, guys, this is only January through September. I do not have my updated statistics from the FBI for Q4, okay? But we know that it was $969 million attempted or diverted from our buyers and sellers. Guys, that's a $950 million increase over 2016. Do you not think these fraudsters are getting smarter? Holy smokes. I mean, that's, that's right? staggering. That's, that's, that is huge. And, you know, at the very beginning, we are seeing mostly seller diversions. Okay. I want you guys to think about a transaction. Okay. You guys sit down with an eight, with a seller, you get them to sign the contract. The first thing you do is you go to the MLS and you put in all that data and then you hit submit in the MLS. There's an IDX feed that goes out of the MLS. It goes to Zillow, Flipkey, Realtor.com, any portal, your website, anything. Those are all public portals. Who do you think is sitting at the end of those portals? These little fraudsters, okay? Our trolls now know that a brand new listing just got put in place in, let's say, Laguna Niguel, okay? And so with that, they know who the listing agent is, they know all of your information, phone numbers, email, uh, mobile numbers. Guess what? Because you brand in your market yourself so well on the Internet. Okay? They also know the seller's information because you can take anybody's name, 
or address, put it on Google, and you know all about them, right? In fact, for me, if you go and throw my name out there, not only are you going to know where I live, you're going to know I have four kids, and for some odd reason, my ex-husband still stays associated with me on Google. Can't seem to get rid of him, right? So, so those are my associations, right? And if I was to receive an email like I did from my husband from one of my kids, and it was something relevant to them on their social media, because these guys are smart guys, I would more than likely click on a video or click on a link because it came from someone I know. So like I said early on, guys, this is when these guys are inserting themselves. They are trying to fish and spoof our sellers and the listing agent at that point, because before it even goes to contract and it's sitting now on an escrow officer's desk, they're already sitting there watching patiently. In fact, I had a situation in Arizona. Here's a best practice for you guys, something to set up every quarter. If anyone uses the rules in your calendar or in your, um, your email, not calendar, I'm sorry, that where anytime you receive an email from a certain person, it drops into a certain folder in your email, go check those rules every quarter at least to make sure that the people that are getting dropped into the specific folders are the rules that you set up. Because in Arizona, I had an escrow officer come up to me and said, hey, how do I handle this situation? I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, my agent was not getting any of my emails and he was getting pissed. He was like, what the heck? Why aren't you emailing me any of the stuff I'm asking? So they got on the phone and they spent probably a good 45 minutes where she kept sending him test one, test two, test three. What he realized all of a sudden was all of her emails, someone had gone into his email account, set up a rule that every time she emailed, it went into the archive. And wow. so what he was doing was inserting and swapping out emails and moving them into the inbox because it's not that hard to make it look like it's a new email and putting information that he wanted in there, not from her. Oh my gosh, that's that's tricky. Yeah. So now we know how some of these nine hundred and fifty million dollars attempts are <laughs> definitely coming in, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So so how do we how do we recognize some of these things? Here's some great indicators, guys. As I mentioned earlier, don't always assume that the emails you receive are legit, right? Just be careful when you're opening the attachments, even if it is from someone you know right? So it could be from potential clients. It can be from lenders. It can be from realtors. We all work together over and over again. It's not that hard for you to receive something from a lender from Chase saying, hey, by the way, you know, I met you at a networking event because we all go out and network. And you could in your mind going, I really don't remember, but hey, he's given me a good lead, right? Yep. Just a little bit more cautious. And like I said, I mean, as much as I hate being on the telephone, I'd be picking up the telephone and calling all of the time. And, and, and in fact, another better practice, guys, even if you do get an email from a lender or from another realtor, you know, do what Kevin says. Go and Google search them. Find a known trusted number and call that number. Don't always follow what's in an email because these fraudsters, when they are going in and spoofing and or being in someone's email, they're changing the phone numbers because the, if you are to call somebody, they want you to accidentally call them. And you know what? Back in the day, it was a lot of broken English, um, you know, emails, phone calls. It was, you know, not the most perfect sentences and things like that. These fraudsters are hiring dialect coaches to teach them how to speak and write better. Okay. Right. And so, you know, remember guys, this is coming from all over the world now. I mean, you know, these can be originated in literally any, any uh, corner of the globe. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at the beginning, everybody thought it was, you know, Nigeria or China or Russia. No yeah. guys, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, a lot of this could even be where, you know, these fraudsters in, in the United States are starting it and doing a lot of the groundwork and they're getting paid referrals to get this money diverted elsewhere. Sure. So don't think that there's not these little working mules in our country as well doing a lot of this. In fact, if I suddenly retire and I never come back and I'm at a beach in, you know, Costa Rica with a <laughs> martini in my hand, 
because I'm now a fraudster because it's <laughs> I'm far slow. I know what these guys are doing, you know, joking aside, but you know, right. it's not that hard because we post it. We put our whole timelines out on social media and we're going to go over some of that as well. But, you know, I just want you guys to be aware of some of these common indicators, right? Um, we have implemented internally that anytime that we, you know, receive the wire instructions, and if it's not handed to internal operations, we're still going to pick up the phone and we're going to call and verbally verify that, um, you know, we got that from the intended party. And the reason why we have to call and ask them for their bank account information is because I don't know if you guys have ever had the whole spoofed calls or spoofed texting. These guys are now taking over our phones. They can, I could actually call Kevin right now if I had his cell phone number and put it that it was from Michelle or one of you that are on this call and on his caller ID, it would show your name and your phone number. And then I could be the one having the conversation and I do this a lot in my live demos where I could have sirens, I could have dogs barking, I have all of these things in the background to distract, to try and get information out of people. The same thing goes with texting. We, you know, we never want you guys to be a part of receiving wire instructions. We also don't want you to be in receipt of receiving, you know, trust documentation, statement of information, any of that personal data that needs to go directly to your escrow officer. And if you ever do receive it, you know, delete it out of your email and delete it again. And then if your client sent it to you that wasn't encrypted in a secure portal, you want to call them and say, hey, by the way, I know you sent this, thank you, but this was not sent in a secure portal and this is very, you know, personal data. Why don't you go and delete it out of your Gmail account and then delete it again? because you don't want to accidentally have something in there if someone ever compromises your email. For okay? sure, in the sent, absolutely. If it's in the sent folder, it's just as easy to access. So you've got to you know, make sure that your clients know that. Exactly. So you know, the other thing that um, I want you guys to think about is, you know, yes, we all work with different languages. We work with a lot of different people. But if, also, if you see something that you know, is broken language and then all of a sudden becomes perfect, right? That kind of is a red flag because I've worked with people where, you know, their emails are so bad and I'm like, what the heck are they talking about? And then all of a sudden I get these beautiful emails of their bullet points and I'll call them. I'm like, so who's your new assistant? Cause that definitely is not your email. And they're like, Oh, how do you know? <laughs> Trust me. I know. <laughs> right. So those are some of the things that you guys need to look out. As I mentioned before, you know, sense of urgency, pressure to take action. At the very beginning, when you're working with them in their welcome kit, guys, you can say, hey, by the way, I will never, ever tell you you have to do something immediately. Now, this may change, but I will always pick up the phone and call you if there is a sense of urgency. I will never put it in an in email, right? You're setting the stage so that they know when they get that email saying you have to go do this now or you're not compliant with the contract or we're not closing on time, you know that that is possibly an issue with wire fraud. Okay. Flag. Yeah. And if it's, you know, it's, it, you know, if it, if it, if it looks like wire fraud, smells like wire fraud, you know, you just take the precautions, make the phone call, you know, assume it is. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing, guys, you're being educated. You have an operation that wants you to have a good understanding of what to look out for. But how many of the people that are on the other side of a contract, aren't doing this. Okay. So it's almost like you need to look at every single transaction that somebody e somebody's email is already compromised. And the other part, guys, if you are ever part, even if it's at the very beginning where you know that someone's email is compromised, where they're starting to have this activity of spoofing or phishing within that transaction, you need to take that transaction offline and literally have everything going through phone calls no more emails. Even if you just go in and change your username and password, the industry that, you know, suggests that's not always the perfect way of doing it. You might want to take, if it is actually with you where someone has gotten into your email, you want to take your computer to the geek squad and have them take a review. In fact, the industry does suggest yearly that we do that. So that's a good point. with that said, you know, those are some of the things that you want to really think about 
what you're doing as well, right? And document it. Because if you are taking your computer on a yearly basis to have them review it for malware and things like that, document it because if ever you got pulled in court, you're doing your due diligence to help protect your system as well as your communications with your clients. Right. Okay? With respect to you know courts and all that kind of stuff, if it, it's always comes down to if you're doing a reasonably good job at you know protecting your client at doing what you can do, that's what they're going to look at because everybody you know you can't you know, foresee everything. But if you're doing at least you know these little steps. I mean, I, I, I won't say all, but I would say the majority of courts are going to look at that and say, yeah, this, this realtor did everything they could, right? Right. You know, and, and that's one of the things that also comes up a lot in my conversations is you guys know your e and insurance doesn't cover you if you get sued on this stuff, right? And you also should know that there really isn't at this point a insurance that will cover you in regards to wire fraud. Now there are some that have insurances with it, but they have a very fine print, strict guidelines of everything that you have to do 100% of the time. And, and if not, it's null and void. Wow. So if any of you guys are looking at some of those little insurances, read the fine print, because unless you are following it 100%, you just wasted your money. Yeah. Okay. So, so with that said, I know a lot of people use free email. I have a Gmail account, right? Um, I want you guys to think about going in and adding an extra layer of protection, right? Yeah. A lot of times you'll see it as a multi-factor authentication or two digit. I want you guys to think about when you are using, I'm just going to use Gmail as an example. Anytime somebody logs into your Gmail account from a separate device that's, that you've already used, you want to make sure that you have it where it sends you a PIN code to your cell phone in a text, and you have to have that PIN code to be able to log into your email. Okay? Because as we're talking right now, I want you guys to all kind of think about what all do you have associated with your free email account? For me, it's all my bank accounts. It's my 401, you know, 401ks, credit cards. Um, it's all my social media, right? All of that is associated with my Gmail account. Now, I want you guys to kind of think about when you are logging into multiple websites, whether it's the MLS or, you know, your bank account at Chase or Facebook or PayPal or Amazon, usually – the username is your first initial last name or it's your email address, right? Or there could be sites that you could go to and says, oh, you know what? I forgot my username. And they just go to that website. Where does that username go to? It goes to your free email account. So if that fraudster is sitting in your email waiting for this stuff to happen and he's in there between, you know, one o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning while we're sleeping, he just got your username. And if you tend to use that username on multiple sites, and we all tend to go to very similar sites over and over, he can go into all these different sites and click on now forgot password. Yep. Where does that email go? Go straight to your email there. Guess what he just gained access to? Okay. Everything he wanted. <laughs> yeah, everything. Right. In fact, yeah. I, you know, I, and I'll use this as a, a quick little story, but, you know, my daughter, um, she's a realtor down in San Diego and she was in Amsterdam and she, you know, tapped into free Wi-Fi. Someone gained access to her um, computer system. And then all of a sudden she started receiving emails on her phone of all her usernames and passwords were being resent into her email and she started freaking out. Now, if any of you guys are parents and you get that phone call like three, four o'clock in the morning from your kid in another country, you are startled. You're freaking out over going, what the heck is going on? And what had happened was someone had compromised her email and was going into every one of her accounts trying to gain access to everything. Okay. So scary. needless scary. to say, we were able to fix that, right? Luckily for her, she was on their time zone. So had, had we not had that right when it was taking place, 
she may have lost money. Well, had she had money in her bank account now, you know, she is a new <laughs> author. Um, <laughs> right. But those are the things. And, and, you know, social media, the same thing, you know, gaining access to our social media. You know, I had a situation, you know, on my birthday um, on the Facebook, somebody had compromised, you know, a high school buddy and was sending messages inside of Facebook, not on the wall, but the little messenger. Okay, guys, best practice, never ever send a link or a video in those messengers. In fact, don't ever click on those things, right? Yeah. Because that downloads, people can take over your Facebook page as well as try and get, try and get into your computer system, okay? So ex-boyfriend sends me a, hey, just wanna wish you a happy birthday. You know, how are you and the family? And I'm like, oh, this was kind of cool. He took it off the wall. He did it kind of more of that personal touch. I respond back and I'm like, you know what? Doing great. How are you and the family? His next response is, oh, not sure if you knew I got in a really bad motorcycle accident. Here is my GoFundMe page. Okay, red flag to me was, okay, this was, there's a reason why he's an ex-boyfriend, but he was the most non-humbling, um, <laughs> arrogant guy I ever dated. And he would have never asked for money. So red flag. So I pick up the phone, I call his sister, and I'm like, hey, is blah, blah, blah right? And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, he got in a really bad motorcycle accident. She's all, he doesn't own a motorcycle. What are you talking about? $10,000 later, they shut down his GoFundMe page. Oh, Somebody had got into his Facebook and started utilizing the friends and doing just that. I was the only one that saw the red flag because I think I was the only one that was still friends with him on Facebook. That was an ex. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that information was definitely there, right? So think about all of those things, guys. What would be compromised if somebody was in your email? So make sure that you go in and you add that extra layer of protection to your email you go and add that extra layer to, of protection to your social media. They all have it, whether it's a pin code or it's a, um, a security question, bank accounts. And if you have a bank account that doesn't have that extra layer of protection, this might be the time you might want to change bank accounts, right? Yep. So think about those things because you don't want to have this situation that could take place, right? And in regards to any site that's asking you for security questions, don't go put in like, oh, what was my, what was my, you know, car in high school? Because, you know, I, I was in high school in the early 80s, and we all had either Pintos or Camaros or Volkswagens, right? So <laughs> it's not that hard to guess. Don't put what's your favorite football team, because mine's the Niners, and it's blasted all over social media. So you want to have an answer to your security questions to something that's not the norm. So if it is asking you, hey, what's your favorite car? Who's your favorite teacher in high school? Put something that else that you love is maybe like your favorite flower or your favorite ice cream, Cherry Garcia, you know, Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. Make that your answer. Mm, Don't always a, answer. I, I've never thought about that, Trish. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> Good, because you're going to implement that. <laughs> you know it. Right? That's, okay, so, so speaking of speaking of like usernames and passwords, guys, did you know that the average fraudster can hack into and crack a eight digit password in twenty four hours? But it takes one hundred and fifty one days for them to crack mm -hmm. a ten digit complex password. Ooh. So think about every single password you guys have and what the characteristics of those. And if anyone still has the word password one, two, three or password, one and then 90 days later you change it to password two password three guys get rid of it don't use the same password on multiple sites don't just change one or two numbers don't put your favorite football team don't put who your favorite child is because guess what we don't have favorites at least they don't know we have favorites right but those those are the things you want to think about in fact i want you guys to write this down there is a website it's called c is in charlie n is in nancy e is in edward t is in tom Dot com. I want you to go to that website and I want you to click on the search button. I want you to put in the word password manager. It gives you the statistics and like all great information about the top password manager programs for 2018. They do the research. You just need to go in and find one that's good for you. That's going to fit your lifestyle and spend the five bucks a month guys, because what it is is it's one that you could put on your phone 
And literally, the only way that anyone's ever going to get my password is my thumbprint has to be on that phone to get into that password manager. And it has all my passwords for all my access. Oh, yes, that was my very I, next question, Trish, is where, <laughs> what do you suggest for keeping track of all these crazy passwords? Because that is it, an issue for everybody I know. Oh, yeah. I mean, trust me, I had a Excel spreadsheet in my computer that said passwords or accounts, yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's the only way that we could keep track of it. But I don't want to tell you guys which one I use. I want you to go and find what's going to work for you. Because if I throw out one that's a little too complicated, you're not going to use it. You're going to say, screw this, right? right. So go in there. And, at, at, and I love CNET because they don't just take advertising dollars to put these in there. They actually do the research and they tell you the goods and the bads of each one. Okay. I love that. So, and could you please just say that, that URL one more time? So it's C as in Charlie, N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, T as in Tom, dot com. So it's CNET. Got Anytime it. I want to find something of good um, technology, I always search it there because okay. they really, and I have for years, my background was in dot com for 10 years before I got in title in escrow. So, you know, I have always uh, relied on their information that's in there. Okay. Excellent. So think about that, guys. Really um, make the changes. You know, I would love the next time I get on this call that everybody has either downloaded that or started using the 10 digit pa complex passwords and things like that. Make these little changes. And here's the thing everything that we will ever talk when it comes to this, guys, you can share with your clients. And it becomes, you become more valuable because you're helping them how they conduct themselves on the internet, not just during that transaction, but from that point on. And you could even think of little drip campaigns to throw out them because we're always looking for touch points to stay in our sphere of influence of past transactions. Give them a tidbit, give them a change. Absolutely. Something else. I, I love that. And all of all, everybody on the line has a CRM system with, you know, mm -hmm. with a drip and that's a great one to add. Um, a good thing to even put into an, a monthly newsletter, right? Yep. I, exactly. And that's exactly. So here's a new one for you guys. And I don't know if anyone has already started implementing this, but I really hit it hard internal operations, um, which is called the passphrase. Okay. And so when you are sitting with your client and you're going through that little welcome kit, have a passphrase that you set up with that client. And the way you're going to educate them is saying, hey, by the way, during this transaction, you're going to be speaking with a lot of people you've never met before. It may be the lender. It may be escrow. It may be someone from title, whoever it is, right? But in order for them to have a conversation with you on this transaction, I want to set up a passphrase. Don't have it be the address or the closing date of the transaction or anything relevant to the transaction. Have it be something completely obnoxious. So today, since it's raining, my passphrase would be umbrella, right? Black <laughs> umbrella. Okay. So, so that way, and, it, and it's something that's done verbally. If you ever see that passphrase show up in an email, you need to change it, right? Because Remember when I was saying, like, we want to have it where we're, you know, we're verbally verifying a lot of things because we don't trust the cell phones anymore because now these fraudsters are taking over caller IDs and things like that? What better way that anytime somebody calls your client, the client says, in order for me to have this conversation with you, what's my passphrase? And then the escrow officer says, oh, it's Black Umbrella. Perfect. That just gave them a sense of security to continue with this conversation. What right? a great technique, Trish. What a great technique. And so, and you know, and I, I've been getting some really great responses because, you know, like, and I'm going to use Vegas as a um, scenario on this, but in Vegas, they never had um, escrow work directly with the buyers or sellers. They literally micromanaged and the agents got all the documentation and they were the only ones that sent things back to escrow, right? Major target on their back out there. And so we had to implement better practices saying, hey, you know what, we're never going to send you wire instructions. We're going to only work directly with your client. But in the same thing is when it comes to personal data, you don't want to have that target on your back. You don't want to receive that data. So we're going to work with them directly here. But in the same thing, let's implement this passphrase so that they feel comfortable with us as well. 
make sure that that anyone that is talking with them has that passphrase. And the emails that are coming back from agents and consumers is like, wow, this is a huge value. Nobody else is doing this. And I'm just like loving that, guys. Take the extra step and do that because they will feel more comfortable. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever received a text message from your bank saying that your credit card is now frozen because you're doing way too much shopping in a certain area, that happened to me in San Francisco when I was at a wine event. I was contributing to this benefit, you know, buying 13 bottles of wine, but I got this little text message that says, your credit card's frozen. So I called that number that was text to me, and he started asking me, because, well, in order for us to have this conversation, I need you to give me your social security number. Okay, I don't care how much wine tasting I did for my benefit <laughs> or for the wine company's benefits. I would not give my social security number. And he said to me, you have your credit card with you. Yes. He goes, flip it over. There's an 800 number. I want you to call that. Guess what? I have my known trusted number, just like your business card. Or when you're sitting there setting the stage with the client, giving your escrow officer's business card telling them never to you know, rely on an email, a text for a phone number, right? Mm -hmm. Called that number up, had the conversation with the lady. She's like, I need you to give me your social. Not a problem, because guess what? I initiated the call to a known trusted number, but then she had to verify who I was. Had we had a passphrase in, in place, it would have been a lot easier, but then I had to go through all the alcohol I bought. <laughs> and she's like, what company? <laughs> Needless to say, finally got to a point where she's like, was there any other alcohol you bought besides wine? I'm like, yes, two bottles of tequila. She goes, okay, I'm releasing your card, right? Yeah. But she also had to do that. So think about implementing a passphrase. And please do not have it the same on any of your transactions. Make it different for every one of your clients. Right. And put it in a place where it's not in an email. It's not in a contact. It's not, you know, it's got to be something outside of your system. Yeah. Okay. All right. So well, Trish, the other thing. Is, oh, go oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just okay. going to say we're, I, we're running out of time, but you can absolutely, yep. uh, anything else you'd like to say. I'm going to just finish off with the Wi-Fi, guys. We all use free Wi-Fi. Okay. I want you guys to think about when you are tapping into Wi-Fi, right? Because I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of what's called Man in the Middle. It's a product that's about $300. And I could be at a Starbucks. I could be at a Tom Ferry event, right? And anyone that is tapping into that free Wi-Fi, I took the host, right? You're still going to get to the free Wi-Fi because I'm a cheap fraudster. But anything you do on your phone, your iPad, or your laptop, it's a mirror on my computer, okay? So, guys, if you want to get spooked out, just go on to Google and search out Man in the Middle. And there is a YouTube video, quite a few of them, talking about what they get, they are seeing everything that you have on your computer, okay? And this is how a lot of these fraudsters are inserting themselves in a transaction when it comes to the buyer, because guess what? Buyer's information is not a public data, right? You can't go to Google and say, oh, is this buyer now part of this transaction? I want you guys to think about that. And then the next time we get on this call, guys, I'm going to talk about more of like, social media and marketing in those aspects of that way. But, you know, best practices, guys, go in and, and put those extra layers of protections on your email. You know, don't tap into free Wi-Fi, right? And make sure that you have the um, password manager or 10-digit complex passwords, things like that, okay? That is amazing stuff, Trish. I really appreciate you coming on the webinar today. And no uh, I mean, just, you know, I learned a lot and there's just so much of this that needs to be implemented. And so we are going to help our agents implement this as well. Perfect. Yeah. So also okay. I'd like to have, and, and of course, Michelle Denise is with us. Michelle is going to be rolling out, you know, Tycor has so many great online uh, tools for agents. And so uh, Michelle, let us know what, what are we going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks? So uh, it sounds like uh, Trish has been a big hit here. So it's quite possible we'll bring her back if the demand is there. We'll have her come back in and, and expand, as we discussed. Um, but, uh, you know, with technology, we have got all different types of tools. Um, a couple that I'm, I'm really big on are Breakthrough Broker 
And then we have a Tycor Agent 1 that's coming out as well. And I'd love to expand on a couple of those products um, um, on our next training classes or webinars. Excellent. And then I know you're an expert on Tycor Tech Farm as well. Or are you, yes. Are you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, and Trish, Trish is the master on the Tycor Tech as well. <laughs> We've got the right person on the call for that one as That's well. That's <laughs> right. Trish is actually the, the Tycor Tech Farm expert, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And perhaps we put that at the top of the list as well. So yeah. um, in communication with the, uh, ARG management and Kevin, we'll, we'll communicate so we can get on the calendar, you know, once a month and, uh, bring lots of good stuff to you. Excellent. We're really looking forward to it, ladies. So again, thanks so much for joining us. Um, agents, I know this one went a little bit long, but this is just so important. So uh, again, ladies, thank you so much. And we look forward to implementing this stuff very, very soon. Sounds great. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Take for care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, uh -huh. guys.